did half my work for me, introduced the speakers for the night. John Stifter, editor of Powder Magazine, MSU grad, uh, will be speaking tonight. Jordi Hendricks, my research associate and head of the snow science program here at MSU, will be speaking to Doug Chabot, director of the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Center. All those people are familiar to many of you in one way or another. So let me just put on the teacher cap here for a minute, let you know where this comes from. MSU has this, this very long history, four or five decades of snow science. You know, from the very beginnings, Bridget Bull, John Montaigne, Bradley, Ed Adams, Jim Dent. We're now at Carl Berkeley sitting here. All the luminaries are in the front row. You know, the next generation's coming along, Jordi Hendrix. Uh, people, this is just this incredibly exciting study of this thing that we go out and have a lot of a lot of fun in. And of course the dilemma is the first video, we all know what we want to do, right? The second one, we need to temper that with a little bit of judgment. And that's what this night is all about. Uh, it's, it's trying to open that door. I'm not a snow scientist. I'm, I'm a social scientist. This is increasingly a social question. Uh, what are you thinking? How are you thinking? How are you behaving? Uh, we all know how to ski and we all want to get after it but we have to do it in, in some, with some sort of prudence. Um, so we're just gonna get rolling here. Yordi wants to say a few words, then we're gonna move right into John, Yordi, and Doug. I'm Yordi Hendricks. I'm the director of the Snow and Avalanche Lab at Montana State University. And what we're doing today is getting out into the field. We're digging a snow pit. We're having a look at the crystal layers, and we're trying to understand what the instability problems are today so we can better understand and forecast the problems in the snowpack. Can we get me in the back there? Fantastic. So uh, one of the things that we were very keen to do tonight was to uh, acknowledge uh, Olivia Buchanan and dedicate this night to her. Uh, Olivia was one of my advisees in the snow science program and she died as the result of an avalanche accident over the winter break. Um, she would have been a senior this year and taking all of what I would term the fun snow science classes. She got through all those hard cut classes that we make you do, the calculus, the physics, the chemistry, and the fun was about to start for her. Unfortunately, she didn't make it. So I just want to share a few words from her obituary, uh, and then I'm going to pass on to John. Olivia Grace Buchanan, 23, died from injuries suffered in Avalanche on January 6, 2015, while skiing in Kendall Mountain, Silverton, Colorado. Immediately upon graduation, she packed up her belongings and moved to Silverton, Colorado in her parents' 1970 Nomad trailer. During that year, she explored the San Juan Mountains, skiing, hiking, and climbing. Charming and persistent, she secured an internship at the Silverton Avalanche School and soon impressed so many, impressed so many who couldn't believe that this girl was so young and knowledgeable and interested in snow science. The internship inspired Olivia to attend Montana State University and study snow geography. She wanted to further her education by earning her master's degree in teaching and psychology. She'd recently written a mission statement to guide her education in which she wrote, I personally want to use my learning to teach avalanche education in the ever increasing world of backcountry skiing with more and more people dying every year. I want to learn how people make decisions, teach them how to make better decisions and save lives. And I think that sentiment echoes exactly why we're all here tonight. <laughs> Olivia's life has inspired her family and friends to further endorse the pursuit of adventure in the mountains. In lieu of flowers, if anybody wants to send donations, they have set up the Olivia Buchanan Avalanche Education Fund, and there'll also be a celebration of her life on the 8th of March in Silverton, Colorado. I know that she would have been here tonight, and she would have enjoyed tonight's event. So I hope you guys all do. And without further ado, word, I'll pass on to Jerry to introduce John. Thank you. He grew, I grew up skiing a, a little area called Jackass Ski Bowl back when I grew up. Now it's called Silver Mountain. He grew up skiing an area just north of there called Schweitzer Basin. Um, double major here at MSU. Local boy makes good. One of the really cool jobs in the industry. And very heavily responsible for this transition to the psychology and the decision making and the human side. So thanks for doing that. We're going to hear that story. To 
bridger is pretty insane. I still can't believe they put a lift up there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's really cool being back here. So thank you to Yordi and uh, Sep and, and Jerry for having me back. So this is a beautiful face. Uh, tons of tons of options, tons of choices to ski here. It's all in tracked. And this is why you flew here. This is why you and your buddies from college flew out to Jackson Hole to ski a face like this. This is a face that you see in the movies and magazines like Powder. And you're only here for three days, so you want to head out there. This zone is out of bounds. You enter a gate to go out to this area, uh, but you have the requisite avalanche gear. You have your pack, you have your partners, you have your knowledge, your brain, and you even talked to a patroller, asked about the conditions, what they've been doing. You looked at the avalanche report, uh, and the AVI report said the danger was considerable. And you remember from your avalanche class that nearly 50% of avalanche deaths occur when the rating is considerable. It's kind of this weird nebulous rating. But it looks beautiful, and you want to ski it because you're only there for three days. And it's supposed to snow the next two, and it's clearly sunny today. So what do you do? Do you ski it? And so with that, this photo is from Stevens Pass Ski Area in Washington State. Three years ago, today, I was there, and I was there for a night skiing story. I pitched a story to be like an accessible, relatable story, covering people that go up to ski after work and there's a bunch of night ski areas in the Northwest. I planned to be there for two days and coinciding with this trip was a women's press trip with Solomon and a group of those girls, a few of them were my friends and also coinciding with this visit was 32 inches of new snow, that maritime Pacific Northwest snow that I grew up skiing. And we shredded hard all day uh, it was super fun, and we went to the bar called the Foggy Goggle, met up with old friends, had a bunch of beers, just catching up, and a few plans were hatched for the next day. It was a Friday, I believe, and the next day was obviously Saturday, so we knew it was going to be busy. I'm like, well, let's go out of bounds tomorrow. Let's, let's you know, ski some of that untouched, untouched snow. And... But first, after the beers, we had to ski for the night skiing story. And this is a shot <clears throat> from that first night that we shot photos. And the snowfall was falling at two inches an hour. So it was just dumping. It was awesome. It was so fun. Just skiing inbound, skiing with buddies, skiing with locals, you know, no pros, just having a great time. And I remember just looking around, taking it all in. The whole mountain was lit up. It was just a glow. It was super beautiful, and I was like, this is, this is why I'm here, this is what I do. And I'm so lucky to be here, like, I love skiing. This is, this is why we all love skiing. And I think this moment kind of captures it. <clears throat> this is my good friend, Jim Jack. He was the head judge of the Free Skiing World Tour at the time. Uh, just a huge personality, super extroverted. He'd do anything for you. Just a super beautiful person and, and skier. And so after skiing, we went into the RV lot. This is a super cool feature of the Northwest, especially Stevens Pass. These people pay for an RV pass for the year, kind of like a season's pass almost for RVs. And everybody gathers, and you know there's various bonfires going on, so we're just catching up, old friends, new friends, hearing what everybody's up to. And of course, we talked about the next day because it was just dumping. And we're like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna go out of bounds tomorrow. It's gonna be a really fun run. And yeah, we were just in the moment, cherishing the warmth of the fire, friendship, and skiing, which obviously brought us all together. So the next morning, it wasn't sunny like this, but uh, <laughs> the next morning uh, I woke up and I checked the avalanche report, the Northwest Avalanche Center, and they confirmed that it snowed 32 inches and the avalanche rating was considerable. And I remember I had a cup of coffee in my left hand and I talked to my friend who's the photographer and I was like, hey, check this out. This is what they're saying. I was just kind of scrolling through it. And he's like, okay, yeah, we should talk to, we should talk to our local friends about it, see what they have to say. 
So I geared up, I booted up, headed out to the lift line, connected with a few of my friends, and these guys were all locals. And I mentioned to them, like, hey, the Avalanche rating is at 30, <clears throat> said 32 inches, considerable. Like, you think we should still head out of bounds? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll just take it slow. We'll, we'll suss it out when we get up there, but we'll just move slow. So uh, after a few inbound runs with uh, Jim Jack, that photo that you saw earlier, uh, we met more friends at the base area. Uh, some of those girls that were there for that Salmon press trip. And also we were waiting for our good friend, Chris Rudolph, who was the director of marketing. Uh, Chris was a good friend. He loaned me his car a couple nights prior. I took the train from Seattle to Leavenworth, which is the town kind of at the base of, of Stevens Pass there. Uh, gave me his car. There were two PBRs sitting in the, in the seat. And he's like, welcome to Stevens. Let's have a good time. And uh, so we were waiting for Chris and kind of noticed the group that we originally had planned kind of swelled in size. And I probably knew like six or eight of them, but all of a sudden there were 12 of us. I was like, wow, this is a big group, um, especially to go out of bounds. Thought about it for a little bit, but you know, I was there with all these locals, these people I trusted, super experienced skiers. I had my Abbey 2 certification, feeling pretty comfortable. And this kind of gives you a diagram of Stevens. <clears throat> and you see the front side there, and then there's Cowboy Mountain, which is basically this ridge. It's kind of similar to the ridge, except it's much shorter um, and not as long, but super steep, super fun. Off the back is what's called Tunnel Creek. And that's this out of bounds zone that gets skied pretty on a regular basis. And I had actually skied it five years prior to this trip for a story that I wrote <clears throat> uh, for Powder just about the resort. And I skied it with Chris and, and this photographer and local skier. So I didn't really know the group, but we hiked from the top of that lift, Seventh Heaven, and we hiked to the top of Cowboy. And we all had our Abbey gear, and we all teamed up at the top. And we briefly discussed a plan, and I paired up with my photographer. And I, I kind of I nudged him, I was like, man, this feels really rushed. Like, we're moving really fast. But I was with this group who had over 100 runs on Tunnel Creek, like over 20, 20 years of experience. In fact, in one of those RVs the night before, we watched like a home video style um, handheld camera movie of them skiing tunnel like in the 80s or I guess early 90s. So I was like, all right, we'll be safe. So half the group skied down, the first six skied down and Jim Jack, my good friend, was the seventh. So like any backcountry run, we were just gonna leapfrog down and the train trap was the creek, was Tunnel Creek. So you kind of ski the rib, the spine, you just kind of stay high in the trees, right? These are 300 year old, old growth trees, Pacific Northwest, you know, those are your anchors, right? Your safe spots. So Jim Jack pushed off and he made a few turns and then he kind of crested this roll uh, even heard a little hoot and then he just disappeared and we kind of noticed this one tree this like this little evergreen tree just kind of like wobbled it was really weird I was like what happened there and we didn't hear anything I had my helmet on but I didn't I didn't hear anything nobody did we skied out and we skied out to this crown which was about two and a half three feet and it went we went down to the bed surface and it was just like a pool table and that's when we realized what happened um, we immediately went into search mode made phone calls nobody answered and we started to descend the slope so this is tunnel creek i mean it's a train trap and so basically we started our search we weren't getting anything and this is a 2000 to 2500 foot long run went down and it just turned into a bobsled track of hell really. Um, just trying to get through there with my skis was, was difficult enough. And we tried to move fast because there was some hang fire. That you guys saw that crown. So we were like, okay, we need to get going. And this is just more of the aftermath. And this is basically, this is what it looked like the whole way down. And so once I got down there, it just kind of fanned out into this big uh, kind of goalie and it just looked like a war zone. Everything that you've seen and 
all your avalanche educational instructional videos. It just boulders the size of cars. It just looked like carnage. And it was a big group. And half of those people that were caught in the slide, um, well, there's there six people. Three of them were caught in the slide, and the other half had already started the search. They broke out their probes, and everybody was probing and searching. We had no idea how many people were buried. I got to the first victim. Uh, my avalanche rate reading on my beacon said 2.6, and it took like a second to register. It was like, oh, that's in meters. So that's six feet deep. And I made a probe strike after a couple probes, immediately started digging, and I dug right to my friend Chris Rudolph, the director of marketing. And we dug him out. We performed CPR for about half an hour before we realized that <clears throat> he was dead. 20 feet below him was this local that I met the night before, husband of two beautiful little girls. And then down around the corner was Jim Jack. And he was pronounced dead as well. So I sat there as we waited for ski patrol and the authorities to come up. And I sat there on the side of the slope and I was, you know, next to my friend Chris. And I just remember thinking, like, I'm never skiing again. This is so stupid. Like, I hate this. It just felt so toxic. And I was scared. I was questioning everything. I was pissed. And I just, I, you know, it was a surreal moment. Doesn't really get any more real than that. And then the, <clears throat> the following months, I went back to powder. I stopped skiing for the rest of the winter and considered quitting because I just I couldn't see how I could work at a job that's all about skiing when this happened and I hated the sport. But I realized, I questioned everything and I, I asked myself, how did we end up here? Like we were all super experienced, we were all super advanced, we were great skiers, we had the avalanche knowledge, we went to the classes, good friends, we trusted each other, like how did this happen? And I realized more than anything that it was these psychological human factors that got us into trouble. We ignored all the warning signs and you think that it would never happen to you, you're totally invulnerable to that risk and it happened. And so that's when we set out at Powder to kind of walk the walk a little more. And we decided to launch a micro site on powder.com called the Safe Zone, just kind of a clearinghouse of information. We linked out to Avalanche Centers, like the one here in Bozeman that dug, dug heads. And it was just a clearinghouse so that everyone could get educated. And then last year we decided, we teamed up with Black Diamond and I wanted to do something really big that focused on these human factors to tell the story that wasn't really being told at the time. And we teamed up with Black Diamond to tell that story, to really analyze why we make the decisions we do in avalanche terrain. And through that, where's Jordy? Jordy. Through that we launched this human factor. So it's a multimedia piece and it's five chapters. And uh, we launched it this November, and that video that you saw earlier was our intro video. So this first chapter kind of looks at and analyzes an avalanche that occurred last October, or excuse me, last winter in Oregon, in the Willowa Mountains in northeastern Oregon. This is these are these six heuristic traps. And heuristic traps are essentially mental shortcuts that we use to rationalize why we make the decisions we do. And this avalanche researcher and engineer named Ian McCammon uh, studied 512 avalanche deaths. And he wanted to know what, what went wrong. Like me, he had a friend that he lost in an avalanche, very experienced skier. And so he, he uh, performed this study and he founded this acronym. And so basically, like my experience at Stevens, we violated all of these. We had the familiarity of the train with the locals, like they knew how to ski it, they thought. There was acceptance, you know, nobody, nobody kind of wanted to speak up. It was really hard, there's that peer pressure. And of course there was the commitment, because we knew that we were there for only a few days, and we wanted to just go ski pal, you know, fun run with friends. There's the expert halo. We were all really experienced, and, you know, trusting of each other. Like I mentioned earlier, it was really busy at the resort that day, so we wanted to head out and ski an untracked line. 
And then of course, you know, there's kind of that facilitation of your peers, you know, like, well, they're here, so everything's clearly safe. And so basically, throughout this, this feature, it just analyzes those, those heuristic traps and talks about what we can do to avoid those. I guess in conclusion, this story basically explores everything that we all think about when we head in the backcountry, but we don't necessarily have that protocol like we do with snow science. You know, like when you're, when you're going out in snow science, you're digging a pit, you have all these tests that you perform, you have these ratings, but when it comes to decision making, we don't have that set protocol. We don't like follow that checklist. Like what's our criteria? And so this story goes into detail, talks about other incidents, and tries to communicate that in a language that is not too esoteric or too confusing, but very simple. Because like a lot of you here, when I was a student here, I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to go skin out the saddle. I wanted to go ski the Northern Bridgers. You know, just whatever, go big. I was young, brash, pretty stupid. And, uh, you know, I, I just realized, like, this is never, I just thought that that would never happen to me. Like, I, I'm totally, this won't happen to me. I'm too smart, I'm too good. And it can happen to anyone. And that's basically what this story explores. And luckily, the work that Yordi's been doing here in the Snow Science Lab is pretty congruent with this, what he's doing, and I'll, I'll let him talk about that. But uh, give this a read. It's uh, kind of mandatory reading for some, for should be for every skier before you head out in the backcountry and explore those group dynamics. Communicate with your ski partners. Talk about the conditions. Talk about what you're feeling if you're afraid to speak up and have that conversation because it can save lives, and I'd love to have my two good friends here today with me, but unfortunately, we did not communicate. So thanks for having me, and uh, pass it off to Yordi. Yeah, these are tough stories. So one thing we don't know is, as you move through the back country, what are you doing? What are you up to? What I'd like to do is get out my hypodermic gun, shoot you, put a radio collar on you, and then track you like we do grizzly bears. Right? University frowns on that form of research. Right? So a few years ago, you already and I were up at ISSW in Anchorage, and he comes up with this idea. And I didn't really know Yordi that much, but every time I'm around him, I keep hearing, well, living on Mount Aspiring in New Zealand with a sh professional chef, chucking 50 pounds of explosives on the Milford Road. Bella Coola, oh yeah, I've worked there. You know, if snow falls, this guy's been there. You know, from the microcrystals to the really big systems. And I'm really lucky because now he's interested in humans. And again, that's what this is all about. So Yordi's gonna say a few words about what we're up to. And hopefully we can sign up a few volunteers for this project. Well, thanks for that great introduction, Jerry. It's completely untrue. Um, and what I'm gonna start with, just before I get into my talk here, is a very short little uh, video clip. This is Doug Chabot with the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Advisory, issued on Wednesday, February 4th at 7.30 a.m. Snowfall yesterday and last night favored the Big Sky area with a foot of powder. Winter is back. The snowfall only ended hours ago and has not had a chance to stabilize. I anticipate the new snow will be easily triggered on steep terrain. I'm Jordi Hendricks, I'm the director of the Snow and Avalanche Lab at Montana State University. And what we're doing today is getting out into the field 
We're digging a snow pit, we're having a look at the crystal layers, and we're trying to understand what the instability problems are today so we can better understand and forecast the problems in the snowpack. We've got this really nice, oh, beautiful powder that fell last night. Great skiing conditions at the moment. And then we've got this crust that you can see here. And this crust is a result of some recent warm weather and potentially is going to be a real problem for us if this slabs up and it could become a sliding layer for us. So we've come up to the slope, we've dug a snow pit, we've checked the forecast, and we've even found that weak layer that we were concerned about. And yet as a group, we still decide to ski that slope. And this is really the key of what our project's looking at. Trying to understand the decision-making processes as a group that sometimes outweighs all of the other information that's presented in front of us. Anytime you're dealing with geography and humans, critical decisions have to be made. And that's what makes this project for me really, really interesting. So what we're doing with this uh, Ski Tracks project is we have an app called Ski Tracks. And we ask skiers to go out in the morning, punch up the app, and run a GPS track for us. Then when they get home, they send us that track, and I ping them back with an electronic survey. And in this way, what we can do is we can collect some background demographics, experience on some of these skiers, and then I can ask them about their decisions for the day. In that way, we can build a composite picture of how people move through this complex terrain. So what we're trying to do is to, um, is to try and fuse together some snow science and some social science and really try and understand how people make decisions in the backcountry. But on top of that, we want to see where they're moving in the backcountry as, as they make those decisions. And this is a project Jerry and I have been doing for a few years. And uh, it's also a shameless plug to try and get you guys involved. So if you haven't heard about this project, please consider getting online and having a look. And we're really interested in everybody. You don't need to be an expert skier to be part of this project. And what we're doing is we're trying to take what we call a sort of a geospatial approach to understanding decision making in what can be a fairly high risk but low probability setting. And backcountry travel is really a nice example of doing exactly that. But it's not the only example. We think our work has application to military personnel moving into enemy terrain or wildland firefighters as well. So it's an issue that's wider than just snow science but has a very applicable need right here. Here's another example of uh, some interesting decision making. It's, uh, how would you feel? Look at this cameraman. Watch this cameraman, this guy standing here. Sorry, he's not a camera, he's not on camera. Standing right on the cliff there. Good example. All right, luckily he survives, all right? So he survives, he's, he, he makes it. He pulls his chute just in time, but you can see, imagine what that guy's thinking right at that moment. I've just lost my base jumper. All right, so that's an example of bottom of the cliff thinking, all right? That's when things have happened and they're at the bottom of the cliff. Very fortunately, this person survived. That's not always going to be the case. So what we see is when we look at most accident analyses, it looks at the end result. And by virtue of there being a fatality or a major accident, we know things have gone wrong. What might be more interesting to look at is trying to look at the patterns of decision making before they go, go off the top of that cliff. So you can rescue them before they make that decision to jump off that cliff or to ski that line, as in this case has happened here. And what we really want to hope, or the, the overall aim, is to try and get some targeted education. Try and find out who are the groups of people, what type of situations are we at most risk of increasing our slope angle usage or making more dangerous choices? If we can intercept before that, then we can hopefully save some lives. And that's really the goal of what we're trying to do today. So what we see is that backcountry travel is a combination of a whole range of factors. You can't just go out there with education. You need experience. You also need the right equipment. So it's a range of things coming together. And when we look at trip information, we don't often have everything in one go. So we don't have information about the people, where they go, how they go, how they make decisions. So we're trying to fill that gap by getting some good information in there. The other part of the equation that we're seeing uh, is that people often have some knowledge of the snowpack and like what John was saying, they knew what the avalanche forecast was. They knew they'd had 36 inches of snow. They knew it was considerable. 
So it wasn't from a lack of snowpack forecast knowledge. They've read that, they've done that education, but they're still making some bad decisions along the way. So the questions are why. So what we did is we started a crowdsourcing campaign last year in the 2013-14 winter, and we used a smartphone application. So Jerry was very keen to tag you all with radio collars. Uh, and as Jerry said, uh, MSU frowned upon that. So we had to think of different ways. So almost as popular as a radio collar is your smartphone. You just about always have it on you, right? So we thought, let's go with smartphones. And we used this, uh, an application called Ski Tracks. And then we also optimized the survey because the smartphone was there to GPS track you so we could see where you were going. But we also needed to ask you questions around how you made decisions. And this was a expanded project from a previous year where we'd given out handheld GPSs and paper logbooks. And we had this eureka moment where we realized that our research methods were about 20 years behind technology. And we went, hey, we could do this with smartphones. So we've managed to do that. And by doing that, it means that really anyone with a smartphone can participate. And last year, we collected hundreds of tracks from all around the world. And we got to see some pretty cool data from people in the US, Canada, Norway, France, Slovakia, and also over in New Zealand. How do people get involved? Well, they went to our webpage, Montana, EDU, Snow Science Tracks, and they signed up. And as part of that, you need to sign up and tell us who you are. There's a waiver there, so we know who you are and that you agree to participate. You then download the Ski Tracks app, and then every time you go out skiing, you record that track, as we can see over here on the right-hand side, and you send that to us. When you send it to us, we return an email to you with a link to a survey, and that really asks some questions around who you were with, how you shared your leadership style, what type of terrain were you out there trying to ski that day. And that really completes the picture for how you're making decisions in the backcountry. We use the Ski Tracks app. It's not one we've built ourselves. It's one that's commercially available. It does cost 99 cents. Uh, I remember when I was a student, 99 cents was way too much to pay for somebody else's research. Uh, and I respect that. So consider that as a ticket for a spot prize. We have spot prizes from Black Diamond, which have been very nicely donated. The reason we use ski tracks is that it does really nice, easy tracking. It also optimizes your battery usage so it doesn't drain your battery very quickly. The other nice thing about it is that you can share really easily. So you can pull up a track, you can pick that track, and then you can send it to us. And that initiates the process of getting that survey back to you. We will also accept GPX files from any other source. So if you don't have a smartphone, uh, apparently 86% of people from 24 to 35 have a smartphone now. So if you're one of those 14% that don't, use a handheld GPS, that's great. Send those to us. We use a smartphone just because we think it's easier for the majority of people. And then you send those through to tracks at montana.edu. So what we do is we combine all this information. And here's an example of some information that we got on. So here's a track from down near Hebgen. Uh, this is a beautiful track, sort of you can see, it came across the lake, headed up, did a few runs on this rib, and then skied out the bottom. And then we take that track and we pull it into a geographic information system. And what we do is we overlay that information and extract the terrain metrics. We don't just do it on Google Earth, we actually pull out some digital files and what we can do then is we can get a distribution of the terrain that's used. We focus specifically on the steepest part of your day. So what are you doing in the steepest part of your day? We then combine that with the survey data. So we know who you are, we know how old you are, we know what type of experience you have, we know who you were skiing with, we know whether it was your one day of skiing for the season before the storm breaks, or whether you're out with some old friends and you've never been there before. We know all these factors that really, we feel, influence your decision-making process. And then we combine all of those together to look at why you made the decisions you did by the terrain choices that you did. Ultimately, your decision is reflected in the terrain that you're using, be that for the avalanche hazard, be that for the group dynamics, be that for any number of factors, but the terrain is that expression of your decision-making. So let's have a look at some data. So here's some data that came in from last year. And what I've got here is the plot of the track, the location just down the bottom, and we've got just some details around the hazard, the traveller, and the experience level. And then I've also plotted up just some slope angle information. And this isn't supposed to be statistically interesting at this point. It's just to kind of give you a sense of some of the data that we can pull out from that survey data. So here's a solo traveller under a moderate hazard using some pretty mellow terrain on their own. Here's a couple of tracks from Alaska. 
This is a modern hazard again. We got three males on this one trip uh, and they were all classified as intermediates. Next one here, this is now from Wyoming. We have moderate hazard, five males, and they're mostly experts. So we can start building composites about the type of terrain that certain groups of people are using under various types of conditions. Here we have one from Montana, low hazard, two males, both experts, really nice long tour. Um, and then we've got another one here from Utah, moderate hazard, one female, one male, both experts. And I've just pulled out just a couple of facts. We've got about 25 parameters for each individual trip for each individual outing. So we've got a lot more information than what I'm presenting tonight. And here's one that made me laugh. And this is a little bit like Christmas. So every morning I open up my inbox and there's some more tracks coming in. It's, it's kind of like Christmas, other than the fact that they're all skiing it and I'm sitting in my office, right? <laughs> so uh, it's, it's kind of like a cruel Christmas. So this is one that, that amused me. This is from Tromso, Norway. Uh, it's about 71 degrees north from the middle of December. Does anybody know what the, uh, when the Arctic night might start? How many hours of daylight do you think you got up in Tromso? You got about zero that time of year, all right? <laughs> so here we have considerable hazard, nine males, one female, mostly expert, and they're in the dark. <laughs> so uh, I'm really intrigued to see what they're going to ski as soon as the sunlight shows, because that's going to be some pretty interesting training. So what we can start seeing is some, some really cool behaviours, some really interesting behaviours, and the hope, as I said before, is trying to find out when or which groups are making risky decisions under certain conditions. So what we can do is we can then group all that together. So these are the same data, and I'm not going to get too tedious into the science here, but what we can do is we can say, let's look at all the tracks that we've got from the same avalanche hazard conditions. Can we tease out different behaviours under different avalanche conditions with the same groups or under different hazard conditions with different groups? Now let's have a look and see if we can tease it out by experience. Do we see more experienced groups behave differently to less experienced groups? Can we see a regional impact? Do we see that people that are in the backcountry of Montana, 15 miles from a trailhead, are making different decisions to those that are in the Wasatch Front Range looking down at Salt Lake with the, uh, the air vac helicopter on, on speed dial. Are they making different decisions? Chances are they probably are. Why they're making the different decisions is really what we're focusing on. So let's have a look at some results. Uh, this, uh, these are the results of, of our participants. We saw that uh, the majority of them were male, aged 26 to 35 were our biggest group. There was some evidence to suggest that gender was important with respect to the terrain that was used. And in fact, we saw that all male groups use much steeper terrain than all female groups. And this fits in with some of the heuristics that Ian McCammon has published as well. We also see that it, with respect to the avalanche forecast, steeper terrain is used under low hazard. And interestingly, in terms of slope angle, just slope angle, there is no difference between moderate, considerable, or high hazard i.e. people were using equally steep terrain under all those hazard conditions. However, and the big however, is they did use different aspects. So you can mitigate your exposure by, by using, for example, the scoured windward aspect opposed to the lee aspect. So we did see some differences there. We also saw that group size is important. This again picks up with some of the anecdotal information we see. We see that some of these bigger accidents are happening in these bigger groups a lack of communication, there's some breakdown there. Our data set isn't big enough yet to be very conclusive about this, but there are some trends or some suggestion that there's uh, some, some evidence here. Bigger groups on steeper terrain. The other one that I thought was really interesting was that 26% of all data were from solo travellers, okay? And all of the expert solo travellers were in avalanche terrain, i.e. on slopes greater than 30 degrees. Under some conditions, that might be appropriate. But under other conditions, that may not be. And one of the things that I'm always reminded by, uh, by and I've forgotten the, the Swiss guy's name, but he says, uh, the, uh, the avalanche does not know that you are an expert. And I think that's something that we should all remember, regardless of our levels, is that the avalanche is immune to your individual skill set and it will respond to your behaviour. So make good choices, use good terrain. Uh, and if you're unsure about the snow, then terrain is always going to be a good answer, i.e. stick to lower angled slopes. If we look at our terrain usage, we saw that in general, expert backcountry travellers expose themselves to much more severe terrain as addressed by slope, angle and aspects of concern. 
However, we also saw that these same experts had a higher level of avalanche education, had more years of experience, had self-assessed high levels of decision-making skills and avalanche train management ability. So the real question here is, do we have a risk compensation effect? Do we have a situation where people that are more experienced are able to gain sufficient knowledge to outweigh the increased risk exposure? We can't answer that yet. If we get more data, then that's something we could certainly look at. But that's really a big question. At what point do we outstretch our experience? At what point do we go beyond what our skills and experience allow us to go? So just in summary, uh, data collection was pretty successful. We got some nice data, we got some nice results from it. We could see some interesting things. Our train analysis was relatively simple, but it did show that based on a number of different groupings, there were differences in the terrain used by different groups of people. But we do need to develop that a little bit further, and we also need to mine our uh, our social science data a little bit further, our survey data. We also applied it to a few other settings. We're doing some work with uh, heli ski operators, looking at how heli ski guides make decisions in uh, steep heli terrain, uh, and also with snowmobilers. People often say snowmobilers are in much more avalanche terrain. Well, we don't really have any good evidence to prove that. I would agree that snowmobilers cover more terrain, but are they actually in more, ter more avalanche terrain over that period of time? Or do they play more in the meadows? So that's one of the questions that we really want to look at is how do snowmobilers move in that terrain that's different to backcountry skiers? But overall, we need more data because by the time you break it down to groups with two men and two men and one woman that are experienced and inexperienced and advanced and intermediate under a low hazard and moderate hazard, you get these very small groupings and it becomes very difficult to be very statistically sound with those results. So the more data we can get, the more we can say about what we're seeing. So we're doing some more data collection this year. We have several hundred tracks already this year from all around the Western US and also into Norway and some into Europe. But we need you, and we need you guys to sign up. But we also need you to tell lots of people about this project. Our results are really limited by how heterogeneous our group is. So the more diverse our group, the better our results can be and the better our overall education platform can be from there. Hope to collect lots and lots of data. Please sign up and participate. And critically, let other people know about it. We've had some great turnout, and we've also got some fantastic spot prizes to give out. So please get involved and sign up. It's for a really good cause. Just want to finish off with acknowledging our volunteers. So that's all of you that have participated. Um, our system at the moment is a little bit cumbersome. In the future, if we get sufficient funding, we'd like to have a one-stop app where you track and do your survey all in one app opposed to this email business. Um, but at the moment, we're having you guys go through a few hoops. So thank you for that. Without your submissions, we'd be nowhere. We also need to thank Mazamas and Montana State University for their support to date. We've done this on uh, what I would say the sniff of an oily rag uh, or on a shoestring. I'm not sure if that's a terminology familiar to you guys. Uh, and also the Undergraduate Scholars Programme. So, uh, you know, we've had a lot of really good undergraduate scholars work with us to do a lot of that data analysis, and we couldn't have done that without their support. And finally, Black Diamond for their great spot prizes that we are giving out uh, about every six weeks to eight weeks to lucky participants. That's it for me, and I'll hand you over to Jerry, and we'll have questions right at the end after Doug's, uh, Doug's talk. Thank you. So this is good news. You know, this sport and a lot of these high-risk sports, we get, we get sometimes overly focused on, on the negative, on the accidents. And they're spectacular, and we see people getting after it, and we see the carnage in the videos, and we think, oh my god, that's what, you know, when my mother looks at that stuff, she thinks, my poor young son is, is doing that. No, he's not. Um, so this is good news. Most of our people are doing what they should be doing. You know, that's why most of us probably aren't getting in accidents, to the extent that you would think. The guy who has a huge vested interest in this is Doug Chabot. And I know a lot of you in here know Doug. You've heard his voice on the morning reports. And I just got to tell you, you know, if I was looking for a guru out there to be traveling in the mountains with, this would be the guy. Doug Chabot. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. 
I like the sniff of an oily rag. And see if I can weave that into the advisory one of these days. <laughs> um, I also like to be referred to the front row as the, the luminaries of snow science, which is kind of code for the old guys. <laughs> um, but I really want to thank John um, for sharing his story of Tunnel Creek because any time we have someone who's willing to come here and give us a first-hand account of something tragic that happened to them, I mean, we can really learn from that and we can, uh, you know, it's just really emotional just, you know, listening to you speak and knowing you were there. So thank you for, for sharing that. I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so and I'm going to talk about side country. Um, what do we call it here? Side country challenges, misconceptions and lessons, plus a little plug at the end for, for digging some snow pits. Everyone knows what this picture is, obviously. This is Saddle Peak. If you ski to Bridger, you know it. This picture was taken in two, February of 2010 after this slid. And so I'm gonna talk about this avalanche because there's a lot of lessons that, uh, that we can learn uh, from that avalanche. Side country. In 2008, uh, Bridger Bowl put in the Sloshman's Lift. And the terrain of Saddle Peak, where normally you had to hike up, you had to skin up, to get there, you're now able to take a lift and then without skins, you can kind of slide on out and hike on up. Now all side country training, whether you're in Jackson, you're in Utah, when we talk about side country, we're really referring to the back country. We're, re we're referring to the back country that's adjacent to the ski area. Um, in Saddle Peak, what's unique there is you can ski the side country and then you can zip back to the bottom of the lift and do another lap. Some side country areas, once you commit to go for it, um, you have to end up at a road or you have to have skins to get back. Um, here, it's kind of fun because you can uh, head on out and then come right back into the, into the area. There's a big difference, obviously, between the ski area and the side country or back country. One is, in the ski area, they do avalanche control. You have ski patrol, they use explosives, they beat the snowpack into submission. Um, as soon as you cross the gate and you go outside, there's no patrol, there's no avalanche mitigation efforts, and you're on a backcountry snowpack. Um, we tend to feel safer because we're closer to the ski area. In fact, we can see it, but in terms of the snowpack, it's, it's backcountry. If you've been up on the ridge above Sloshman's Lift, this is what you'll see. You'll see all these little warning signs. Um, it should be pretty obvious when you leave the ski area boundary because you're going to walk by all these signs. They'll say danger, you'll die, there's cornices, it's horrendous. But what's truly amazing is there are so many people who wander past these signs. They go to the top of saddle and they are unaware that they are now in the backcountry. People tend to think that it's safe that there's maybe been some control out there, that there's no way the ski area would allow you to go out there, or the forest would allow you to go out there um, if it was dangerous. But the reality is, is the side country is always open. There's no gate here. You just walk along the ridge. Anytime that lift is running, you're free to walk out, just like you're free to drive your car up highlight and head on up a, a trailhead. This is basically just a, a trailhead at the ridge. Um, and Bridger worked really closely with the Avalanche Center and the Forest Service um, to create these signs to try and warn people about the dangers. But there's some problems. If you're a skier and you want to ski Saddle Peak, just the nature of Saddle Peak means that, you know, it's big, there's no safe zones, chances are there's going to be people above you, and it gets crowded. When you want to be out there and skiing is also when a hundred of your best friends also want to be out there skiing. And despite our best efforts, despite the avalanche advisories, despite all the side country avalanche awareness, the place gets hammered. It gets bumped out. I mean, I never thought I'd see the day when there'd be bumps off the summit of saddle, but it happens. In fact, it's happened right now. Um, there's bumps out there. Um, so we see all different age groups, all different folks out there. In fact, there's this, you know, was it three years ago, there was a whole group of sixth graders that were out there getting ready to ski and thankfully some locals convinced them that they should probably get back into the ski area instead of heading down saddle. So you see a little bit of everything out there. 
Um, why is this so unique? You know, what makes Saddle Peak really unique in terms of side country is one, you can see it from the lift. So it's not hidden behind trees, it's not behind a ridge. Like as you're riding the Slashman's Lift, or any of it, you see it from Bridger Lift, you're, you're looking at people dropping in off the summit, you're seeing these plumes, big rooster tails of powder. It's so inviting. And as John pointed out um, with the Powder Magazine articles where they were highlighting a lot of Ian McCammon's work on human factors and heuristics, um, they're all a play here. You know, we have the familiarity, you've got the herding instinct, you know, you've got the expert halos, you have all that happening, you know, right here. And then you have this complex terrain. You've got serious avalanche terrain, serious avalanche terrain above 200 foot cliffs, and you've got kind of a recipe. In 2009, um, things kind of came to a head because just having human factors and just having serious terrain isn't enough to have kind of disaster or impending doom. We need a bad snowpack. And in 2009, we got it. The season started that year with a lot of early season snow. Unfortunately, this is not what this year looks like. <laughs> but we, we got a lot of snow early season and then it got cold. The first, uh, first week in uh, December, we had minus 25 degrees. We had a thinner snowpack and it turned all the snow on the ground into sugar, into facets, into depth pour. And we ended up with what's called a deep slab avalanche problem. And so we, we formed this weak layer, um, kept snowing. And the middle of December, I went out to Saddle Peak with Carl Berkland and we were trying to decide, we were gathering evidence and gathering data about, well, what's, what's happening out there? I mean, a lot of people are skiing it, what's it gonna look like? You know, we don't always know if skier compaction happens during critical times. Um, and also, it, as Carl pointed out in the video, it doesn't work with deep slab issues. As soon as we have a hard slab, we're not affecting that weak layer. And that's important because there's a lot of people that believe um, or believed this year um, in 2009 and 10 that their ski tracks, that because they skied this so much that they were breaking up the weak layers or making it safe and, uh, and that it wasn't, their line wasn't gonna slide. And we know that's not true. And because with a, unlike within a ski area, we certainly can't test with explosives, so we're just kind of letting nature take its course. What happened was, is we got a lot of snow. It was an awesome year. Um, it was unstable, but it was also awesome in terms of how much snow fell. Um, so it was a pretty snowy January, snowy in February, and then right here, we got hammered. We got two feet of snow, high winds. It was just a weekend, three and a half inches of water, that's snow water equivalency. So that's a lot. And so the, um, during this storm, those three days, the Sloshman's Lift was closed. Um, no one was out on Saddle Peak skiing. They opened on the 15th. The 15th was a Monday. And the ski area ran the lift. And people went up and, I mean, three, two feet of dense snow. People, like, immediately went to the top of Saddle, started skiing off of Saddle. Um, let's see, on Monday it was a high danger. On the next day, on Tuesday, was a considerable avalanche danger. Now just a, a word about avalanche danger. You know, as John was pointing out, you know, there was a considerable danger, you know, in the Tunnel Creek. Um, there's many times when we have considerable danger as a skier, even myself as an avalanche forecaster, if I'm going somewhere and someone tells me, or I read considerable danger, I immediately have a question. And that question is, why? Why is it considerable? Is it considerable because it just snowed a lot? Is it considerable because the wind blow? Or is it considerable because we buried a weak layer? Um, because the why is really important as to what, how I'm gonna treat you know, that, that slope and what exactly I'm gonna do. So we had a, a considerable danger on that Tuesday. So Monday it gets hammered, people ski it. Tuesday, Tuesday dawn's clear, it's beautiful. Still lots of lines left. 11 o'clock in the morning this kid is standing at the top of Saddle Peak. He walks over to the edge and he kicks a cornice off by accident. And the cornice is about the size of a Volkswagen bus. 
and it breaks. He falls off. This is taken seconds after he, he fell off. Um, in fact, you can see the powder cloud behind him. Um, the, the, the Volkswagen size bus chunk rolls down the hill about 100 feet and it hits a weak zone. And as soon as it hits this weak zone, meaning it hit a thin spot, in this case it hit a thinner little rockier area, we have the trigger, which was the cornice. It initiated that fracture right there. And then because there was a prominent widespread weak layer, that layer was able to propagate across that whole slope. And so that whole thing went. Now over, is there a little pointer on this thing? Okay. If you've skied saddle off the top, people look at this ridge right here and they say, oh, that's, a, that's our safe zone. That's safe there. And uh, I think this picture proves that that's not the case. <laughs> so anyway, so avalanche happens. It's huge, or not huge, it's big. It's a big avalanche. And uh, no one was caught. It was unreal. It was just pure luck because people had skied it before um, and had gotten all these tracks the day before. So when it went, it pulled out all these tracks. This is looking downhill right after the slide. The, the debris went right down into this area here. Now people talk about it being like huge, historic. Um, it wasn't, it was a large slide, obviously. But when we look here downhill, you see this, the, the run out zone here, kind of the, the trim line here where, the, where it's taking out all the trees. That's historic, that's when it goes big. And that was not the case in this, in this avalanche. <laughs> so here this huge avalanche happens, everyone knows it happened, there's no like, you know, you don't need to call it and warn anyone, everyone in the ski area saw it. Um, so Bridger Bowl responded, they were first on the scene, ski patrol, um, doing beacon search, they got avalanche dogs over there, initiated uh, Gallatin County search and rescue to, uh, to, to come out, um, and one of the biggest things was just trying to determine how many people were caught, are there people missing, um, and then you know, is, uh, is there danger for some of the rescuers? So it took, it took a little while, it took a few hours, um, but it was determined that as far as we knew, no one was caught. There was no one that was seen, uh, you know, getting caught and, uh, and luckily um, it was true. This is down below. Um, I took this picture right after we were done searching and the whole left side here is what released. Um, but this whole side here, hadn't gone yet, the football field. And so while we were doing the search, we we're doing beacon search, we we're doing a quick scuff search, um, the wind's blowing, it's reloading, and there's a real concern that this could go, especially if it was triggered by maybe a, a skier up there or someone just, you know, or a cornice falling, anything like that. So we were, we were concerned, we ended up pulling out and uh, just because we were concerned for our own safety. Um, but, you know, large avalanche. But when we look at huge and we look at historic, we need to go back to March 1980 because this was the last time when everything went. The football field over here went and the main gut went. And, uh, and that was a, an enormous uh, slide. What's interesting here, this, is, this was the title slide, the title picture. This, was, this picture was taken uh, the day after uh, the slide is all these tracks. Most of those tracks happened the day after the avalanche. Now, if there's a few things, if there's just one thing you remember tonight, there's just one thing, and that is re recent avalanche activity is the number one sign that adjacent slopes are also unstable. So if you see an avalanche, even a small avalanche. It means that the snow around it, the other adjacent slopes are also unstable because similar slopes have a similar snowpack. Um, so a lot of people went out here and they skied and they, and they, they skied because they, they, they had some misconceptions. Um, they had some misconceptions about Saddle Peak and they also had some that they carried over the next day. One is, is that tracks on a slope mean that it's stable. And I have to say, like even as a professional, when I go somewhere, whether I'm snowmobiling or skiing, when I show up and there's tracks everywhere, 
I certainly think like, okay, that's that's not a bad sign. I mean, that that's okay. I, I like seeing tracks, you know, on, on stuff versus just seeing crowns everywhere. Um, so, so, you know, I get that, but as this avalanche shows that that alone, it doesn't show stability. Um, another thing people say is, well, the trigger had to be big, you know, uh, that's the reason that that went and, you know, we can see this other stuff because there's not going to be, there's no big cornices over the football field, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be fine. Well, there's a grain of truth to both of these because certainly tracks on a slope, you know, can stabilize a weak layer if you're skiing through it. Um, but in this case, there's no compaction, there's no stabilization because as Carl showed us in that video, uh, it was that weak layer was protected by a really dense hard slab. And big triggers matter. I mean, if you're trying to get an avalanche, a big trigger is a good way to go about it. But a small trigger in just the right spot can also trigger huge avalanches. So it doesn't have to just be a big trigger. Um, another thing we heard is that the reason Saddle Peak went is because the ski area should have opened the lift because if the, if if the lift was always running, if Schlossman's never closed, if they just ran it, even now, you know, during the storms, that meant that people could get out there and they could, they could ski it and break up that weak layer. And that's a total myth. That is, that is absolutely not true. Um, and the other one is self-justification, where a lot of skiers, you become familiar with this and you're like, well, I would just ski it yesterday. I skied it on Monday. You know, I skied it on Monday, it didn't slide, you know, I slid Tuesday. Um, but, you know, I was really smart. It didn't go on Monday. I knew it was going to go on Monday. <laughs> I mean, you can tell yourself anything after the fact. We're all geniuses. You know, and then, of course, the herding instinct, you know, which is if enough people go there, we're just following and, and a line of people. And on some of these days, literally, there's a line of dozens of people, you know, leading up to the summit that, that all this means that, well, you know, I mean, they're all doing it, no one's dying, should be, should be pretty good. So these are all the misconceptions that we have. So where are the safe zones on saddle? Well, there really aren't any. <laughs> and it, um, there are maybe some safer areas, like maybe that ridge, but in reality, there aren't great safe zones up there. So do you ski it ever? Well, yeah, I mean, there are times to ski it. I mean, avalanches are all about timing. Um, you know, and certainly when the danger's lower, um, you know, it could be a time to go out there. But, you know, the bottom line is, is you're, you're taking a bit of a risk. And you just need to be aware of that because the risk you're taking is it's not just you and your one friend and you're going to ski it one at a time. There's going to be other people out there. There's going to be triggers all over the place. And the terrain is really unforgiving. So if it, something does go wrong... Um, it's going to be hard to survive. So there's no real great safe zones, unfortunately, on Saddle Peak. And remember that as people go out there, you know, people are triggers. And once we get triggers, all they need to do is initiate a fracture. And if that initiation can get some legs and actually propagate on a weak layer, as we saw in the slide from 1980 and then also in 2010, um, we get avalanches. It was two years ago the football field went. Um, so, you know, it's not like avalanches don't happen out there or it's rare, it's, it's somewhat common. So you just want to be aware of that. Um, do tracks indicate instability? I think Carl just kind of took that myth and told us that no, they don't indicate stability. What I like about this picture is you can actually see the tracks in the crown face. You know, you can see how it just ripped out all these old tracks. Um, literally probably hundreds of tracks over the course of, of a, few, a few months. Um, so, so how do we help? How, do, how, do, how can we help you make decisions about going into the backcountry? Well, what we do in our advisories is we give you some very basic information and try and give you some basic information in, in kind of an easy to understand way so you can make some decisions. We're going to tell you how much it snowed, where it snowed, what are the winds doing, what's the avalanche danger, has there been avalanche activity, are there weak layers. Like remember I said earlier, like we're saying it's considerable, you know, and you're saying, well, considerable, what does that mean? Like why? Ideally, from watching our videos, from looking at those pictures, and from reading our advisories, you're going to know why. We're going to spell it out for you as to what to look for. Because a one-word avalanche danger, if all we did is we said, oh, it's, it's moderate today, that's all you get. 
Like, that's not very helpful. You know, you need to know why. Why? And what can you do about it? How can you, how do you behave? What should you do? What should you be looking for? And we want you to rely on that information because that's real information. It's real data that we collect versus all this outlier data that people use to make decisions such as, oh, there's tracks. I was there yesterday. It's totally good. You know, like I know Sal or I know this area, whatever it is really well. I know the highlights really well. Um, and, and other people are doing it and, there, and there's no consequence. So that is not what you should be basing your decision on. It should be on actual what is happening with the snow. Um, and you can go out there, I go out there, we all, we go out there, we ski, it's just, it's all about timing and it's also about understanding the risks and understanding what you're choosing to do. Now I want to take a few seconds or a few minutes here and I want to talk about digging snow pits. Because if you're going in the backcountry, if you're a backcountry skier, you now, I'm going to assume something. I'm going to assume everyone here that goes backcountry skiing, you, you already have, you, you're wearing a beacon, you've got a partner. So you have your beacon, you have your shovel, and you have your probe. You know, so you, you've got all your stuff, but you still need one more piece of gear. And the piece of gear you need is this right here. It's a piece of string. And what you do with this piece of string, if you carry this with you, is this piece of string allows you to isolate columns and do really fast stability tests. And you can do extended column tests incredibly quickly and you can get some incredible, valuable information with just this piece of string. Now, if you've never taken an avalanche course and you're skiing in the backcountry, I recommend you take an avalanche course. But if you're gonna head out and you don't have a lot of experience, um, if you're new to backcountry skiing, get your string and then go to our website, mtavalanche.com, then go to forward slash stability tests and we have videos and the videos show you how to do an extended column test. And you can do these stability tests. You don't have to be on steep slopes. Uh, in fact, you get the same results if you're on flat or terrain. So it's important to do them. And what we recommend if you're new to this is if you do an extended column test with your string, just takes a few minutes and you get that to propagate, meaning you know, you're, you're tapping it, you end up tapping it 30 times if you get it to propagate where the whole column goes wham and it fractures clean, just the whole thing fractures, that's enough to not ski the slope. That's enough to just be like, okay, I'm out. I'm going somewhere else. I'm going to ski back down my skin track. I'm going to be on low angle terrain. I'm not getting into avalanche terrain. You can just keep it really simple, but it's really, you know, find it really valuable. We use it all the time. I dig tons of pits and I don't dig them just because I'm supposed to dig them. I dig them because they're really, really valuable. Um, also with digging pits, there's, I saw Jamie was handing out uh, this month's Avalanche Review and there's an article in there um, called uh, Human Factors in Digging that I wrote that the Avalanche Review published. It's also on our, uh, the blogs of our, of our site and, and if you're interested in this little topic, I recommend reading it. Um, the reason we dig a pit, there's one reason, and it's to know it's under our feet because there is no way to know because, the, well, there's no way to know. It's just, otherwise you're just guessing. You can either guess or you can know. And the only way to know is to put your shovel in the snow and dig. When you dig and you do your quick little stability test, you're now going to have something to base your decision on. You're not just making things up. You're not saying things like, well, oh, it feels good. It feels good to me. How's it feel to you? Yeah, it feels good. You know, <laughs> it's like, okay, I mean, uh, that's great, but you know, we're actually going to have something to hang our hat on because if you're going to go skiing, if you leave the car and you're going to go skiing that day and you're now standing at the top of the slope and you're going to go skiing, if you take three minutes and you do a stability test, you might get a piece of information, which is going to cause you pause. And you know, digging, it's a reliable, quick way to search for instability when the signs are not obvious. It's life-saving information. Two days ago, a friend of mine went up to Highlight Peak. It's a low avalanche danger. Okay, so we got low avalanche danger. We haven't had an avalanche in a long time. And uh, haven't had any snow in a long time. And he goes up there and he goes all the way to the top of Highlight Peak with his buddies. And he, you know, he, he leaves the car. He's like, I'm gonna go ski Highlight Peak. I mean, why not? So the whole day he's thinking, yep, skiing Highlight Peak, skiing Highlight Peak. Gets up to the top and he decides, ah, 
you know, better dig a quick pit. Just do something fast. Pit. Digs a pit, takes out a string, does an extended column test, wham, gets it to propagate with six taps. It's like, holy mackerel, no way. And he backs off and he goes skis another slope. And that is why we dig. Because if he wouldn't have, he would have gone on that slope and it might have worked, but it might not have. He wouldn't have been basing it on data. And so another thing that we like with digging is with all these heuristics, with all these human factors, you know, the, the follow the leader, the expert halo, the familiarity, um, whenever someone in the group stops to dig a pit, everything slows down. The whole group pauses, everyone takes a breather, people come together, they look at the snow, and they talk. And so it's just all of a sudden, some of these human factors, which are very real and lead us down a dangerous path, sometimes when we stop like this, those heuristics start to evaporate. They start to go away because now we're together and we're talking about stuff. And I have to say that if you're in a group, even if you're, you're a beginner, we'll say you, this is your first backcountry tour. You've never even dug a snow pit, you know, and you're standing there in a snow pit with your friends and someone taps that snow and you watch that whole block fracture and fall into the pit, you're going to be like, whoa, that doesn't seem good. <laughs> and if your friends want to ski it, they're going to have some explaining to do. They're going to have to, I don't know what they're going to say, but they're going to have to say something. <laughs> so it's very visual and visceral. And uh, so that's why we really, uh, it's why it's so powerful. And then in, to keep it simple, you know, if you're, if you're a beginner, you're just getting into this, you're just you're trying to build a breadth of knowledge, or kind of a, a breadth of experience, you know, just go with the simple. If it propagates, don't skip. Um, you know, if you're more, if you've been at this for a few years, you can start paying attention to all these other nuances, but really nuances aren't what kill people. And this, if you haven't seen this, what John put together in the, the Human Factor series, it's amazing. It's, it's really, truly a great series. And I pulled this quote out from Ian McCammon, who's kind of the father of avalanche heuristics here. And he says, you know, he studied these 504 deaths in the study. And he says, if the 504 deaths tell us anything, it's that the six heuristic cues have the power to lure almost anyone into thinking an avalanche slope is safe. And that is, that is very true. Any of the six heuristic traps can lure us in, but one stability test can snap us out. And that's why it's important to do stability tests. So dig, be safe, have fun, and yeah, let's hope it snows. So <laughs> that's all I got. Thanks for your patience.